Hey, thank you, George. Good afternoon. It's uh, lovely to see all of you here. Uh, I was looking at the schedule for the um, Value um, Investment Conference, and it's an outstanding schedule, um, led by George Athanasakis. George has been now the Ben Graham Chair for Value Investing for the better part of 10 years. And he's developed the course, I think many would say it's among the best in North America. And of course, he's um, got this uh, competition going for the first time uh, this year. So I just thought we'd begin by just recognizing what George has done. Give him a nice round of applause. Now, it's my uh, pleasure to um, um, introduce Wilbur Ross. Wilbur Ross is a good friend. Uh, we've done many, many uh, deals together. You don't need much of an introduction for Wilbur. Um, Wilbur's um, biggest deal, I think, the one that uh, put him on the limelight was uh, Bethlehem Steel uh, when it went for restructuring with other large uh, steel producers. Wilbur put them together, created the largest uh, U.S. Steel Company, which was then uh, taken over by um, Arcelor Steel, Mittal Steel, and which became the largest steel company. Um, Wilbur's done the same in other distressed fields, in textiles, in auto parts, and he did it in coal, through international coal, which we were fortunate to participate with Wilbur. It, was a, it worked out to be a terrific uh, deal. Um, Wilbur um, manages about $10 billion. His um, rate of return since 1997, when he worked for Rothschilds, and then in 2000 he bought the uh, private equity firm, um, believe it or not, approximately 44%. Uh, that can add up, Wilbur, after some time, 44% a year. Um, Wilbur worked for 24 years as the managing director for Rothschilds. Um, before he acquired the firm. Wilbur is a graduate of Yale University and the Harvard Business School. Please join me in welcoming Wilbur Ross as one of the best private equity investors around. Thank you, Prem. It's nice to have such a stirring eulogy while you're still alive and can enjoy it. Uh, I'd also like to join with Prem in thanking George Atasakos for putting together this event today. It's from the audience and from what I gathered the other speakers are, seems to me this is really a first-rate event and you all should be proud, as I am, to be part of it. Bank of Ireland has been a wonderful investment, so it was easy to accept Prem's invitation to discuss it today. But since many of you may not be too familiar with our firm's other investments in banks, I thought we might start with that. Our first serious investment in a bank turnaround was First New Haven National way back in the 1970s, where we put in a new team, made a few complimentary acquisitions, and then sold it at a happy price to Shawmut Bank. For the next 25 years, we focused mainly on industrial situations. But then uh, we bought a bank from the Japanese government, a failed bank in Osaka. We restructured its strategy, restructured the branches, put in seven top new management people into the bank, and two years later, it was earning 18% on equity, and we sold it at a very nice price to Sumitomo Mitsui Banking. When the U.S. banking crisis hit in 2009, we made the decision to get very, very involved in banking. We started with the second largest bank in Florida, Bank United. We bought it with the help of an 80% loss sharing formula from the FDIC. And we backed a man named John Canis. John had previously built up North Fork Bank from 25 million with an M in deposits 
to more than 50 billion with a B 30 years later when he sold it for three and a half times book value. He served out his non-compete with the buyer and then made an alliance with us to find a failed bank for him to run. 18 months and 100 prospects later, we decided upon Bank United. At that time, investors believed that Florida would sink into the abyss, just like the lost continent of Atlantis. But I live in Palm Beach, and I was convinced that the warm weather, no state income or inheritance tax, and Miami's emergence as the capital of Latin America would propel enough inbound migration to quickly offset the overbuilding that had occurred. This has proven to be true, and within two years, Bank United went public at triple our cost and it was the largest U.S. bank IPO ever. We went on to do another half dozen banks in the U.S., mostly with FDIC assistance, and we also joined with Sir Richard Branson in Virgin Money to buy the failed savings bank, Northern Rock, from the U.K. government. That brings us to Bank of Ireland. Prem, of course, knew all about our bank transactions and just had invested successfully with us in International Coal Group, which we and he sold for three and a half billion to Arch Coal, happily before the industry collapsed. Therefore, it was logical for him to think of us for a Bank of Ireland. Prem knows Ireland well because he has some reinsurance activities there, and he is also a large investor in Kennedy Wilson, a very well-run real estate investment operation. Kennedy Wilson had bought some distressed assets from Bank of Ireland, and they alerted Prem to the equity investment opportunity. As usual, he moved with lightning speed to organize a syndicate consisting of ourselves, capital research, and fidelity fund to invest in the bank. The deal structure itself was unusual because the government had already announced a standby underwriting commitment for a massively dilutive rights offering to the existing holders of the bank. The sovereign fully expected to have to buy virtually all of the offering, but our group sub-underwrote 1.05 billion euros of the obligation, and government agreed we would be allocated our full request, if need be, from their pre-existing holdings. They also agreed to a board seat for Prem and one for me, and just two seats to government, with the majority of the board to be independent. Most importantly, we got a side letter from the finance minister acknowledging that the bank had to be run in a commercially reasonable manner. But the most interesting part of this deal was Ireland itself. A big bank in a small country is really a warrant on the local economy. So you truly had to get the macros right. You could not micromanage your way out of bad macros. We were familiar with Ireland because we had studied it for more than a year in connection with another possible bank deal there. We liked what we saw. Prior to the banking system blowing up the whole economy, Ireland had been well run, with sovereign debt only 25% of GDP, a fully funded national pension fund, <coughs> and favorable trade balances. U.S. corporations, and this may surprise you, U.S. corporations already had invested $160 billion in this little country of 4.5 million people. That's more 
than U.S. corporate investment in all the BRIC countries combined. There were several reasons why. Ireland is the only country using the euro that more or less speaks English, has a young and well-educated workforce, and good transportation and IT infrastructure. Most foreigners think of Ireland in terms of pretty red-haired girls, green pastures, old castles, and lots of golf courses. But actually, it's a high-tech economy. Pharmaceutical companies are the largest employers there and the largest exporters from Ireland. In fact, those little blue pills that give so many men in this room so much pleasure mostly come from Ireland. There also are leading medical device companies, internet people, social network operators, internet games and wagering companies, IT producers, and software developers. Finally, Ireland has by far the lowest tax rates in Europe, and in addition, has special tax credits for research and development. As you may know, it also provides lots of administrative services to international financial institutions. For all of these reasons, it was clear that while Ireland had a huge one-time case of indigestion from the bank bailout, once it got over that, it would be very healthy again. It did not have the long-standing and systemic problems of the Club Med countries. It did, unfortunately, have 14.5% unemployment, a shrinking GDP, soaring mortgage delinquencies, and plummeting real estate prices. And that's obviously what caused the crisis. The key clearly would be fixing the banks. And that was indeed a huge task. Amazingly, bank loans in Ireland at that point were nine times the size of the economy, by far the highest in Europe, and 10 times the ratio of bank loans to the US economy. The banks also were loaded with sovereign debt. Therefore, it was clear that the fates of the sovereign and of the banks were inextricably entwined. Neither would be stabilized until both were. When the crisis erupted, government acted swiftly. They slashed the federal budget and set up the National Asset Management Agency to acquire the bad real estate construction and development loans from the banks at discounts of up to 50%. They forced bank bondholders to convert to equity. And in the case of Bank of Ireland, had done a rights offering at 55 euro cents per share. Then the regulators brought in BlackRock to reevaluate the loan portfolio. And their analysis showed a need for still more capital. So they then underwrote the second offering at 10 euro cents each, less than one fifth the year earlier price. This is the deal in which we participated. Our analysis was that if actual results came in somewhere between BlackRock's base case and their stress case, we would have a very good investment because we were coming in at 35% of pro forma book value. That would have made Ben Graham's eyes tear to know that. There was a very big cushion. Once we concluded that we could accept the loan loss risks, the questions then became management quality and a host of complex issues relating to the organizational and capital structure of the bank. We quickly concluded that the new CEO, Richie Boucher, was the right man for the job, even though 
he had been part of the senior management pre-crisis. This was a wildly controversial decision at the time and remained controversial for a couple of years. Prem and I, however, felt confident that he was tough enough to make the hard business and political decisions that were needed and knowledgeable enough to make the correct decisions. So we made the investment and our immediate reward was that within 60 days, the stock went down 20%. At that point, I violated the first rule of trading and bought some more while praying it wouldn't go down anymore. Prem stuck with his original position. The bank had the biggest market share in Ireland and the least horrible portfolio, but it also had three other potentially valuable assets. It was the sole bank in the 11,000 branches of the UK postal system. We were fascinated with the idea of such a vast distribution system without having to absorb any basic overhead costs, just pay a commission on assets generated. The UK was almost half the total balance sheet, and we knew from Virgin Money and other sources that the UK was not in bad shape and was recovering rapidly. Second, Bank of Ireland had a mid-cap leveraged buyout lending business in Europe and in the US with excellent creditworthiness and a strong net interest margin. Third, it had New Ireland Assurance Company, the number two life insurance company in the country. It seemed to us that this combination could sell at a high multiple of book value once it straightened itself out. But to get from here to there quickly, both the sovereign and the bank needed to regain investor confidence and access to capital markets even before their turnarounds were completed. We concluded somewhat immodestly that our billion euro commitment and the attendant hoopla, as well as my ranting on CNBC, Fox, and BNN, would help some, and it did. Uh, immediately after our deal was announced, Deutsche Bank restored major credit links to Bank of Ireland, and others soon followed. But we knew that the bank had to make tangible progress quickly. So the following game plan was adopted. One, push immediate increases in allowance for loan losses as high as a reasonable model would allow in order to protect against future surprises. Two, avoid foreclosures and immediate losses by restructuring loans for borrowers who wanted to pay but had limited means because of the recession. Three, renegotiate the pension obligations to reduce the billion euro deficit. Four, implement 2,500 redundancies and shrink the office space. Five, modify the tracker mortgages which were providing a negative gross interest margin. Their rates were pegged to the European Central Bank's lowest lending rate, which was artificially low at the same time as the cost of deposits in Ireland had soared. Six, get rid of the government guarantees of all deposits, which had cost the bank 380 million euros in the first year. Seventh, disassemble the patchwork quilt of contingently convertible securities and simultaneously repatriate the government's investment of almost 5 billion euros in those securities. Eighth, resolve the geographic mismatch of assets and liabilities that led to excessive FX hedging costs. 
Ninth, upgrade an inadequate IT system and become the first Irish bank to offer real mobile banking. Tenth, reduce the loan deposit ratio from 170% to 115%. Eleventh, convince the EU to permit the bank to retain its highly profitable insurance business even though the Troika had ordered its disposal. Twelfth, somehow maintain organizational morale by going through all of these traumas. And then lastly, avoid any further equity issuance until it could be done at a premium to book value. As you can see, there wasn't much work needed on the bank. Remarkably, all of these objectives were achieved by management, though a few, most notably elimination of the expensive government guarantees, did not occur until March of last year. Let's go through them. Bank of Ireland had had a defined benefit pension plan with, as I mentioned, a billion euros underfunding. Huge burden. The staff was naturally worried that the bank might not revise itself and therefore be unable to meet its retirement obligations. After extensive negotiations, we agreed that in return for benefit revisions that cut the unfunded liability by 400 billion euros, <clears throat> Bank of Ireland would prepay over the next three years a similar amount, namely 400 million that otherwise would have been paid in later years. Now there was one further peculiarity to this part of it, which is that under Irish law, you must get the written consent of each individual plan participant in order to reduce that person's future benefits. Ultimately, more than 90% of the bank's employees signed up. So the unfunded liability has been cut by 400 million euros. The bank quickly consolidated two headquarters into one and closed some underperforming branches. And the management agreed with the bank's union that it would seek only voluntary redundancies by offering lump sum payments. The offer ultimately was oversubscribed, so the bank was able to fine tune its acceptance of the resignations by department and by time phasing. Time phasing was important because the bank had to make sure that the redistribution of work would not interfere with customer service. In 2012 and 2013, a bit over 2,000 redundancies were achieved and severance of roughly 185 million euros was paid. There probably are a few hundred more layoffs that will be achieved this year. The tracker mortgages were more difficult to fix. Imagine the practical and political problems of raising rates in a high unemployment environment that is also characterized by low interest rates. The bank did so wherever the contracts permitted by a series of 25 basis point moves, each one of which caused us to be attacked in the press. On those trackers that went into default, the bank changed the whole rate structure. Often the trade-off was postponement of principal amortization in return for a higher interest rate. This left the borrower with a smaller monthly payment, but improved our yield on the loan. Extinguishing the government guarantee was even trickier. In order to avoid runs on the banks, the Irish Treasury had agreed to guarantee 100% of all deposits. And that was good from the stability point of view, but they were charging Bank of Ireland 380 million euros a year for doing so clearly an unaffordable cost. So shortly after our investment, 
we got the bank to agree to pay 25 to 50 basis points more interest to their large depositors if they would waive the guarantee requirement. And quite a few of our major depositors agreed to that trade-off. <clears throat> we soon became convinced that we didn't need the guarantee at all, but government was worried about the rest of the banking system, which was not in as good financial condition as we were. And eventually they did end the scheme effective March 31, 2013. And there has been no perceptible effect on deposits since then. Some deposits, though, were of a year or more duration and therefore won't be totally expunged until about the middle of this year. The other pr deposit problem had been that the government-owned banks were very illiquid and they tried to gain market share by offering depositors 50 basis points more than we were paying. Over time, they gradually learned that the marginal amounts of deposits they gained did not justify paying such a premium on all deposits. And as our credit worthiness improved, the base level of rates came down as well. So we're now operating with a bit over a 2% net interest margin and heading north. When we came into the bank, it also had billions of pounds sterling of mortgages that were booked in Ireland and financed with euro-denominated deposits. But it also had billions of pounds of excess deposits in the UK, over in the UK subsidiaries. Over time, management convinced the UK regulators to let us transfer most of those loans to the UK, thereby ending a very, very severe currency mismatch. The bank also modified its prior very costly program of interest rate swaps. The IT system, like that of many European banks, was archaic and not properly integrated. Now, 100 million euros later, that has been pretty well resolved. And along the way, B of I became the first Irish institution to offer mobile telephone banking and to put internet lounges into the branches. This has been wildly successful, especially with young people. Restructuring mortgage loans also has been successful. Tailoring the payment schedules to borrowers' ability to pay has delayed repayment of principal, but 86% of the restructured loans remain consistently current. This has avoided the necessity of foreclosing and reselling properties at the bottom of the market. And property values for the last several months finally have been recovering after having collapsed by about 50% from the peak. Loans at 170% of deposits meant that the bank was very dependent on wholesale deposits, what you and I would call hot money. Management quickly sold off 10 billion euros of marginally performing loans at 92% of face, thereby cutting its ratio to 115%, well in line with other European institutions. The EU, as I mentioned, had ordered divestiture of the life business. The problem with that is that it was a 131 million euro earner, and in that environment, we doubted we would even get book value out of it. The reason they had ordered the divestiture was to punish the bank for getting into trouble in the first place. But once we had achieved the initial milestones for fixing the bank, we went back to the EU. And our argument was that this was a complementary business marketed mainly through the bank and that it was a source of strength to the institution. With the help of the Irish government, we eventually agreed with the EU 
that instead of selling the life company, we would shut down our UK corporate lending business. This was a low margin operation with a small market share, so it was not a great loss. As these developments unfolded, morale gradually improved. To accelerate it and show shareholder support, whenever I was over for a board meeting, the CEO and I would go to a couple of branches and talk with the staff. The bank also had me give pep talks at dinner meetings they held for groups of major corporate clients, particularly American ones. Finally, we wrote letters to the CEOs of every major corporation that had pulled out during the crash. We explained that the bank was now on sound footing and asked for a meeting with the CFO. Some of the letters actually worked, and that word too spread through the bank. The bank's most remarkable achievement though was the underwritten sale of three billion euros of covered bonds, one billion of cocos, 1.25 billion of senior unsecured bonds, 1.3 billion of preferred stock, and 537 million of common stock at a premium over book value. A total of over $7 billion of issues in about a 16 month time period. Every one of which was oversubscribed and traded to an immediate premium. Now issuing so many securities would be a major achievement for any company, let alone one that had not yet returned to profitability. From these public issuances and loan guarantee fees, interest and dividends, the Irish government has now received 6 billion euros from Bank of Ireland, 1.2 billion more than it put in, and it still owns 13.95% of the stock, which is worth about a billion and a half euros. And just as Ireland exited from the bailout in November, it's now clear that the bank will be profitable in 2014. The transformation has not gone unnoticed by the equity markets. The stock is now owned by 205 institutions. And early in 2014, Fairfax and W.L. Ross together sold about three quarters of a billion euros of our positions into an incoming inquiry from Deutsche Bank. The price was more than three times our original cost and we sold a bit more than a third of our positions. So we have more than recouped the original investment while still retaining most of the shares. We sold because the appreciated market value of our positions had become too large relative to our respective portfolios. This was a happy problem to have, but nonetheless one that had to be dealt with. This sale, plus the 537 million euros of new equity sold by the bank late last year, added about 1.3 billion euros to the float. That's a very healthy thing for the bank to be so widely owned. Fairfax and W.L. Ross remain on the board and have no immediate plans to sell more shares. Now, as you can gather, there were myriad pieces to the puzzle, and most of them were specific to this situation. But this saga also reinforced several lessons we had learned earlier about distressed investing. First was that the more complex the situation is, the less chance there is of competitors bidding up the price. In fact, no one else offered to do the sub-underwriting. Other private equity funds made proposals, but they involved all kinds of bells and whistles that were unacceptable to the government. Second was our theory that you often get paid generously for perceived risk, but that you don't necessarily get paid for taking real risk. 
So we spend a lot of time trying to figure out which is which. <coughs> Investors who just read the headlines without doing detailed analysis thought that we were nuts in going into Bank of Ireland, and as it happens, they were wrong. Third, implementation is the sine qua non. I used to have a plaque on my desk that read, I would rather back a mediocre idea that is brilliantly executed than a brilliant idea that is poorly executed. You heard in my explanation of the game plan how many tasks had to be accomplished and were. Next, it is always tricky to deal with governments, but in times of adversity, you can negotiate a sensible transaction with them. It is also true that later, when you cash in, there can be a backlash, especially from the left wing. But the Irish government was not swayed by such populist sentiment despite negative press commentary on our recent sale of Bank of Ireland stock. They recognized the invaluable assistance we gave to the bank and to the government when they both were in trouble. They also are grateful for the six billion euros that they got back. So they've been very relaxed about our sale of shares. In fact, two weeks ago, Steve Schwartzman who was not involved in Bank of Ireland, hosted a breakfast at Blackstone for Prime Minister Enda Kenny. As I came in, Mr. Kenny reached across the table to shake my hand and said with a smile, well, Wilbur, you did pick up a few pennies the other day, didn't you? I wish that the US government would be that pro-capitalistic. Finally, timing is everything. If we had come into the first rights offering, at 55 cents instead of the second one at 10 cents, we would still have a loss years later. We've learned historically that coming into turnarounds too early can be very dangerous. The earlier you come in, the danger that your price of entry is too high or that you don't have all the facts or that it simply may take longer than you thought to resolve are all risks. It's virtually impossible to pick the exact bottom, but in general, I'd rather get in a little later and pay a bit more for higher quality data points. I have another plaque with two sayings on it. The first one reads, duration is the natural enemy of rate of return. The second one reads, time equals risk and feel very strongly about both of those two. And they explain why we try very hard to get our cost bases out at the earliest sensible opportunity. The sooner you're playing with the house's money, the more likely you are to make a high rate of return. Now, since we are at the Ben Graham Center, I'd like to compare and contrast distressed investing with traditional deep value investing. Both are similar in that they seek imperfect markets where there are anomalies between price and fundamental value. But deep value investing, a la Ben Graham, seeks good companies, not turnarounds, and tends to be open market, passive, and non-control seeking. This means that the key determinant of rate of return is how long it takes for the gap between value and price to close. If you look at a typical deep value portfolio, the realizations tend to come most often from a third party takeover of the company, not just from changing market sentiment. The fact that something is statistically cheap does not guarantee that it will become expensive anytime soon, unless there is a catalytic event of some sort. If not a takeover, it may be a stock buyback, a leveraged recap dividend, a spin-off of part of the business, a new management. Some important event 
that shakes up the status quo. In our activity, the distressed investor is himself or herself the catalytic event, and we accept the trade-off of an illiquid position in return for control or quasi-control. In a very real sense, in the Bank of Ireland deal, Fidelity Funds and Capital Research were far more clever than Prem or myself. First of all, they got the exact same economics that we did. No management fees or carried interest for the two of us, even though we had to take responsibility for the deal and go through day-long monthly board meetings in Dublin. They just bought their pocketbooks, but benefited from our slave labor. Given the outcome, this may be the first time in my adult life that I haven't mind being exploited. This brings up another point. We historically have tended to do our deals on a solo basis. We think that club deals are fine when everything is going smoothly, but when there's trouble, the situation needs a dictator, perhaps a benevolent dictator, but nonetheless a dictator. Sick companies cannot afford to waste time on endless meetings or to listen to multiple voices. They need to take decisive and timely action. With Prem, it's different. We know each other so well and have been through enough bumps in the road together without ever having a material disagreement that a quick phone call usually solves the problem. We're both hands-on enough that we really know what is happening and what the alternatives are. So communication between us is very efficient and the same is true at the level of the working staffs. Even more important, we've been comrades through enough wars that we trust each other. Let me give you a dramatic example. A few weeks before we actually did the Bank of Ireland trade, we also had received a strong bid. It turned out, for some highly technical reasons, that I could not sell for a couple of weeks. But instead of hitting the bid himself, Prem's attitude was, we came to the dance together, we're going to leave the dance together. So he held back from selling. Now, as it turns out, we got a 6% higher price by waiting, but I know that it could just as well have gone the other way. And if it had, I know there would have been no complaints from Prem. He's a real partner, and that's no baloney. Thank you very much.